deserves all the praise, amen. He gave us all, everything on the cross. Come on, let's give it back to him this morning. Just one word. Let's believe there's nothing our God can't do this morning, amen. Just one, just one word. You call the storm that surrounds me. Just one word. The darkness has to retreat. In just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Oh, just one touch.
Come on. 
Hello, everyone, and welcome to another message in our Summer at Gilead series. The theme of this whole series for this summer, and of course, we decided what these messages were going to be even before uh, this became the, the uh, summer of being unsettled or the, the summer where all of our lives around the whole globe were shaken to the core. And, and this series is basically... Uh, to help all of us that are already believers to find that abundance in life, not just know that we have this wonderful life in heaven waiting for us, but Jesus tells us in John 10.10 that he not only saved us for heaven, but he saved us to have an abundance of life here. And that abundance doesn't mean a lot of stuff. It means a lot of impact, that we can make a difference in our world. And I hope that uh, with what we're going through as, as a world through this pandemic and, and shutdowns and, and this upheaval that's going on in everybody's life that we will see that the things that we thought were so important in this world, you know, going to work and being consumers and driving certain cars and all that, that all of that has kind of lost its luster because we've had time to think about what's really important. And what's really important, I want to summarize it. Today's message uh, is summarized in a little, little song that I learned as a little boy going to Sunday school right here in this church. And, and the song went like this. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. And then it says, let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. And then the verse that we all loved as kids was, not going to let Satan blow it out. No, I'm going to let it shine. And the other one was, put it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. You don't light a candle during power outages, during storms, and put it underneath something. You lift it up so it illuminates the whole world. Our lives have been lit by Jesus Christ. He has illuminated us with his salvation and grace. And we need to lift that truth up because our world so desperately needs to see that light. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says this in verses 14 through 16, that you and I, we are the world's light, a city on a hill glowing in the night for all to see. So don't hide your light like that children. Don't hide it under a bushel. No, Let it shine for all. How do we do that? Well, Jesus says, let your good deeds glow how we live, how we treat people. Let those good deeds glow for all to see so that they will praise your heavenly Father. Even the people that don't like you, people that don't believe like you, when they see us making a difference in their lives, they will praise our Father, heavenly Father, because of what he's done for them. I've always wanted to pastor a church, and I I think, Gilly, that we are grasping this church, this truth as a church. There's two reasons that the church exists. Number one, the church exists so that we gather together and we are basically encouraged and built up, and that's one thing that the church exists for, to build up the believers, but also to build up those believers so that we go out in the world that doesn't know Jesus and reach those that don't. So it's a twofold thing. The church exists not just for... A lot of people think the church is a place to hide behind its walls so we don't have to deal with the craziness of this world. And I can understand that because the world is crazy. But the church does not only exist for us. It does exist to build us up in the face so that we can go out and minister and make a difference. The church also exists to reach the world. It's a twofold purpose. And one out of whack with the other makes the church kind of unbalanced. The church that says, man, it's all us four and no more and becomes a holy huddle. And that's really not what the church was for. It's, it's taken out of context. Or the church that does nothing but reach and reach and reach and forgets building up the believers. It, it gets out of balance. And so we need to maintain a balance. The church does not only exist for us, but it does exist to build up those that are in the faith, but also to reach those who are not in the faith yet. Now, you might be asking, well, 
you know, that, that's a job for the, the, the clergy. That's a job for the, the pastors, the ministers. That's not me. You know, who, who me? What do you want me to do? In fact, the word clergy and laity are two words that you will not find in the Bible. Those are not scriptural terms. Those are, are terms to describe. Actually, clergy is, it comes from the root word cleric. It means somebody who's able to read, if you know what I mean. That's really the root word, what it meant, because pastors or priests hundreds of years ago, they were the only, only educated people in town, the only ones that could read. And so the laity or lay men they were placed, there was a, a dichotomy between the two, a division, those that were clerics and those that were lay men. But the Bible doesn't make any such distinction. I am no different than any person in this church. I am a sinner in need of the saving grace of Jesus Christ, just like every other human being on the planet. I'm not here, and it, we're all ministers, if you know Christ, we're all ministers of the grace of God that has happened in our life. Isaiah says it this way, chapter 60, verses 1 through 3. Arise, all of us, that's you, me, arise, shine, for our light has come and the glory of the Lord shines over us. For look, boy, this is so true, darkness covers the earth, doesn't it? And total darkness over the people. But the Lord will shine over you. He'll use you to be a shining light, and his glory will appear over you. And if we allow this to happen, it says nations, in verse 3, nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your radiance. Did you hear that? The leaders of the world will say, what's different about you? Why in the midst of this darkness are you shining as a light? So the first thing, if for this to transpire, there's four things that need to, be, need to happen and we need to recognize. First of all, we need to recognize that each one of us, I am a minister. You're a minister. I'm a minister. All of us have to be able to say, I am a minister. That's what 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, that all of us are a chosen race. If you're a believer, you are a royal priesthood, a royal minister, a holy nation, a people of God's possession, so that we... All of us may proclaim the praises of Jesus who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are ministers with a message. Everyone who knows Jesus, you got a message. Well, I'm not trained. I didn't go to seminary. You don't, know, you don't need to go to seminary to share Jesus. You need to just tell someone who's in darkness, this is what Jesus did for me. And he can do it for you as well, you're just telling them your life story with Jesus. So we have to first recognize I am a minister. Secondly, we have to recognize I'm a minister with a, spe a, a specified purpose. You were all made to, to fit a unique part of God's plan in building his kingdom, a specified or a specific purpose. In fact, the Bible tells us God's plan preceded your creation. He had a plan that preceded us being made, and he made us to fit specifically within his plan, a unique part. And there's only one of you on the globe. There's only one believer on the globe made like you to fit your specific piece of God's puzzle in ministering in this world. And there's nobody else to take your place. It says in Ephesians 2.10 that we are God's creation, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared, I love this, prepared ahead of time before we were created so that we could then walk in them and participate in the process or the purpose for which God created us for. So I am a minister with a specified purpose Three, at an opportune time. Why do we live in this place and at this time? Because God made us and fit us specifically to live at this opportune time. It tells us in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, Paul writes in verse 15 and 16, pay careful attention then how we walk. He called the Christian life a walk. 
one step at a time. So he said, be careful with your decisions, okay? Be, because we should make decisions not as unwise people, but as wise people. And I love this next phrase, making the most of the time. The word there means opportunity. It actually means a window of opportunity in the original language. That means that the window is not always open, that we have to take advantage of the time, of the opportunity, because the days are evil. So we have to recognize each of us are a minister. I'm a minister with a specified purpose at an opportune time. And then number four, to make an eternal difference. We, for decades now, when I became a pastor, I said, man, we need to, we need to feed people. And, and we opened up a food cabinet right here in church. It does it two days a week. And for those, I just want to give a shout out to our food cabinet team members. You're doing a great job. You're feeding people. But it's not about just getting food to people. See, we can feed the whole world. But if we feed them and don't give them Jesus, we've not accomplished what God has for us. The reason we feed people is for the opportunity to give them the gospel. It's food plus the good news of Jesus Christ. When we send teams to Guatemala, to uh, the village that we minister there, then we build houses, we give them gifts, we meet physical needs in their life for the purpose of giving them the good news of Jesus Christ. Because that, the good news, is what makes an eternal difference. We have to combine our good works with the good news. First Corinthians tells us that there's works that'll burn up, good things that will burn up and not make it into heaven, but there are things that make it into heaven. And what is that? Things that we attach the gospel to, the good news of what Jesus Christ did for us. It says in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 12 and 13, if one, anyone builds on the foundation of Jesus Christ with gold, silver, costly stones, or wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become obvious, for the day will disclose it, because it will be tested or re revealed by fire. What will be revealed? Whether or not it's lasting, whether or not it's eternal. See, fire burns up wood, hay, and stubble, straw, but it does what? It purifies gold, silver, and precious stones. So with our opportunities, there's an op there is a way to make it eternal that the rewards will go with us. And that's why the Bible, Jesus, so many times said, make sure you don't put your treasures here because they'll burn up. Put your treasures there where they will last forever. And what does that mean? Giving the gospel to souls that need it. It says it will be revealed or tested by fire, and the fire will test the quality of each one's work, whether it was a temporary work, as a good thing, you fed people, but you didn't give them what they really needed. And what was that? The good news of Jesus Christ, because that takes care of someone for all eternity. So when you put all those things together, it's making these decisions. I am a minister with a specific purpose at an opportune time to make an eternal difference. Now, you're, you're saying, man, that sounds great, so what am I to do? Well, the next decision you, you need to make is to find your ministry, what God has put you here for. And Ephesians chapter 4 tells you that part of my job is to help you discover what you're here for. In Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, it says, now these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, and I'm, I'm on that list, the pastors and teachers. And what did God give gift me to do to help you find your purpose because he goes on to say my responsibility as a pastor is to equip to build up to inform God's people of what your purpose is so that you can do what so that you can do the work of the ministry and then the process we build up the church to reach its potential in helping others find their their ministry and their purpose so that we can reach those that don't even know Jesus Christ. This is the true body of Christ. My job is to help you discover that so that you can do the work that you were made for, the purpose that God puts you 
here for. Isn't it amazing that during this pandemic, all the things that we thought were so necessary and we could not live for out, we found live without, we found out, yeah, we can live without them. We can live without going to work every day. We can uh, go without punching that time clock. There's, there's a lot of ways we found out of doing life. And we thought, my oh, bet. I, I couldn't do without that. And we found out, yeah, we can. We can do without a lot of things. And we found out that our families were really important, that our children and grandchildren were really important, and that the stuff on TV was not that important, and that there's an agenda behind a lot of things that people do in authority. And we've, we've, we've discovered a whole bunch of things. Hopefully the scales have fallen off your eyes. And you, like me, you have been reminded of what's really important in this life, and that is making a difference for eternity in the lives of those around you, your family, your loved ones, your friends, your co-workers, but then the greater world that's so lost and in darkness. We have been called to be that light. So how do we find what we're made for? First of all, you will find it through your gifts and passion. There are things that you're gifted to do and that you're passionate about. It wasn't an accident that you're passionate about certain things and other things you don't really care about, that you're gifted to do things. I like to say it this way. You just have eyes for certain things. There's certain things that are just appealing to you, and those are usually the areas of your giftedness. There are certain people that are gifted for uh, uh, organization, and I'm not one of them. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm gifted for encouragement, but my desk is not an organized place. There's other people that I work with here at church, and they're, they're gifted in that organizational thing, and everything on their desk is just so. I'm not going to tell you who that, but Sean and Dean, you know who you are. And, and their offices are neat and tidy, and they have lists and charts and do all this stuff. And if I had to make a to-do list, it would take me all day to make the list, because why? That doesn't come easy for me. Okay, but for others, you can't move until you make a to-do list. And you make that to-do list and you're off fire and why? You have eyes for that. That's the way God specifically made you. You have gifts. You have passions. God just wants you to leverage them for the kingdom. It says in Romans 12 that all believers, according to the grace given to us, there's not a believer that doesn't have this grace gift in their life. We have different gifts, different charos. We all have a super, supernatural divine enablement to go along with our personalities, our natural giftedness. But God says, if you're a prophet, use it according to the standard of one's faith. If you're a server, use it in service to others. If you're gifted in teaching, use it in teaching. If it's exhorting, that's why I think, my, then, then build people up, encourage them. If it's giving, then be generous. If it's leading, then be a diligent leader. If it's showing mercy, then give out that mercy with cheerfulness. You have gifts and passions. Start using them and leveraging them to reach others with the light of Jesus Christ. Secondly, you find your ministry through your life experience. There's things that we have learned along the way. A lot of people ask me, ah, are you bothered that that you're bald? And I said, no, I earned this baldness. I earned all these wrinkles. I earned the scars. I, I'm like, no, these wrinkles came at a cost. The scars that I have, they come with the story behind them. I don't want to erase that. Life experience, especially the times where we get the scars and get the wrinkles, man, I, I wouldn't trade anything for some of those life experiences. Although when you're going through them, many times it's very difficult and, shall I say, painful even at times, but life experience, hopefully you learn things. You don't run into a wall and say, boy, I can't wait to run into that same wall tomorrow. Hopefully you learn, you know what, that wall's there, it's not going to move, I need to go around it. That's life experience. Romans 12 says, and, and I love this out of the message, Paul writes, so here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your life experience, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walk around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. So you have gifts, you have passions, you have life experience, but you also have, and this is what many times people say, well, God can't use me because I have this pain in my past. 
And they think that that pain and that horrible thing that you went through disqualifies you from God using you, which it couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, many times our pain uniquely qualifies us to minister to somebody else going through the same pain that we have experienced. Someone that God has delivered from substance abuse, they are the uniquely qualified person to help somebody else struggling with substance abuse. Those that have gotten their finances in order when before they owed everybody in town, they're uniquely qualified to help somebody else get their finances back on track because our pain uniquely qualifies us to be a blessing to somebody else. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Paul says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our God is a merciful Father, and He is the source of all comfort. Can I get an amen there? I mean, God is just full of comfort for our lives. I love this. It says that He comforts us in all of our troubles. But it doesn't stop there, and he does. God, is a, his mercies are new every day. He has comfort for us in our pain today. But he doesn't just do it so we can say, whew, glad that's over. Man, I don't want to live through that again. No, that's, that's not what he comforts us for. It says he comforts us and gets us comfort in all of our troubles so that we can be a comfort to others when they go through the valley that we went through. See, when they are troubled, we can come alongside them and be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. So you've got some gifts. You've got some things that you're passionate about. You've got some life experience, but we also have some pain that God has comforted us in. And when you put all those things at work and being a blessing to others, you will find your ministry. You will make a difference for eternity. And here's... Here's what I love most about You will see it be a blessing to others, and you yourself will feel very fulfilled, and you will live a purpose-filled life because God has used you to make a difference for others for all eternity. I'd like to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes at this time, because it's so easy to get off the track. It's so easy to let the, the pressures of today, the emergencies of today, get us off track from living this purpose-filled life that God has made us for. It's, it's very easy to get off track on a daily basis that I'm a minister, that I've, I'm put here, I'm living on this day for a specific purpose, that I was gifted specifically to make a difference in other people's lives for the kingdom's sake. It's easy to get off track. But this message, that's why we're doing this series this summer, to get us back on track, that God has given us this wonderful gift of life and the second gift of eternal life so that we can bring that light to the dark world around us. And he's not asking you to do something out of drudgery or something that you hate. He's saying, use what you love. Use what you're gifted. Use what comes as easy to you as breathing. And be a blessing to others with it and he will bless that and make a difference and your light will shine forth in this dark world that we live in heads bowed and eyes closed let's pray together and if you've never let the light of Jesus illuminate you from the inside I want to pray for you right now and, and just right where you sit listening to this message you can pray wherever you're at and you can say Jesus I need you to do for me I'm in darkness. I don't know where to turn. I'm turning to you, Jesus, in full faith and surrender and asking you to place your light inside of me, to save me and give me a hope and a future. Just tell him right now, dear Jesus, I love you for dying on the cross for me. I believe in you with everything that I have. Now, Jesus, forgive my sins. Come into my life and make me a light as you shine your light within me. I surrender my life to you today. Thank you for being a merciful God. And if you're already a believer, let's pray together. God, use us in a mighty way. Help us to understand the gifts and passions. Lord, the opportunity that you have placed in our lives to shine your light in the world around us. 
Lord, get us back on track as a church to not just encourage and build each other up, but be that light that shines in a dark world so that they will come to us and say, why is your light shining? And we will give glory to you, Father, and make a difference for eternity in others' lives, thus bringing immense fulfillment to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thanks for joining us online today. I want to thank you. I can't believe it's already the second week in August. It seems like this summer is, is flying by. And I want to, I, I, I know that hopefully you're like me, that school is starting up soon and, and you're looking forward to that. But that also means that people are, are squeezing in those last summer vacations. So I just want to encourage you to remain faithful in, in the giving of tithes and offerings so we can remain faithful and in reaching and making a difference in missionaries all over. This, this pandemic has hit all of our missionaries, all of their, and our church planners, their, their lives have been um, altered as well as ours. And a lot of our missionaries and a lot of our church planners, especially in foreign fields, they have gone from doing church to becoming food distributors because as America has, has ground to a slowdown, that has, interrupted the food chain all across the world and so your faithfulness is making an immense difference to all of our missionaries all around the world and here right in Downriver, detroit you can give online you can give with your phone you can mail your gifts in uh we are continuing to do services at 10 a.m we're looking at uh changing that sometime in the fall but you can join us we're practicing social distancing we got a place for you here. If you're not comfortable with that, you just continue uh, joining us online on our daily uh, devotionals and also with our weekly messages. But God bless you, and let's let our light shine for the world to see. Lift up our eyes, see the King has come.